Welcome to the Paperless Productivity Podcast, where we have experts give you the insights, know-how, and resources to help you transform your workplace from paper to digital while making your work life better at the same time. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tim Zerzicki from ImageSoft, and I'll be your host. Today's podcast is going to discuss the current state of contact tracing being done here in the United States. We hope to shed some light on contact tracing, how it's being done, various technologies being used, the success of different approaches, and talk about our customers who are building automated tracing strategies in their local jurisdictions. Joining me today, I have Vince Hansen and Terry Chaudhary from ImageSoft, who have been on the front lines of understanding the current contact tracing solution, where they fit, and how they're being used. Vince and Terry plan to tell us a bit about the exciting tools that are being used in the fight of the spread of COVID-19. We're going to cover a lot of ground today, so let's jump in and talk about the technology being used to help public health departments during the pandemic. Let's start with the baseline of contact tracing. We hear this term all the time used. Please take a moment to really define what that is and what that should mean to the listeners out there. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, You know, in, in public health, contact tracing is really the process of identi- uh, identifying people who may have come in contact with an infected person and the collection of further information about those contacts. By tracing the contacts of those infected individuals, testing them for infection, isolating them, treating them, uh, and really tracing their potential exposures public health really aims to reduce infections in the general population. And, you know, while we're all dealing with, um, you know, the the current pandemic with COVID-19, this really isn't something new. Uh, It's been used with other uh, other diseases like tuberculosis, measles, uh, sexually transmitted infections like HIV uh, and bacterial infections. Uh, It was also used during uh, SARS and uh, and H1N1 uh, outbreaks most recently. The the real goal of contact tracing is to really interrupt the transmission and reduce the spread of the infection. Uh, The public health agencies are really looking to alert contacts to the possibility that they've been infected and offer some type of information to them, some preventative service or care. Uh, In that diagnosis and counseling of those already infected um, individuals, they can identify whether it's treatable and how to prevent reinfection of the original uh, infected patient. Um, These epidemiologists are really also looking to learn just more about that specific disease and how it affects a particular portion of the population. Excellent. Thank you. Terry, what are some of the biggest challenges with contact tracing in general? The biggest challenge is probably just managing that influx of data. So when something, you know, at the level of of COVID happens, uh, you get so much data coming in from all the different areas and people just aren't usually equipped to manage that much information. So that's number one is getting a handle on that and then having that reliable information so that they can make those good decisions and actually track things down. And as Ben said about tracing all those contacts, that's so crucial, but it's also about, you know, getting back to the cause. Where did this start? Where, where are areas that we really need to focus on? And then once we understand more about that, we can obviously now look for focusing, you know, personal care or education to those people who really do need it. Tim, the, the other challenge I think is, is testing. Um, uh, as we've tried to reopen, we have more and more people taking tests. Um, many have no symptoms. Many have no exposures. Uh, some folks wake up and say, hey, I, I think I will take a test today. And because we all so desperately want to go back to normal, it has stopped us from being able to react to the growing number of tests. Uh, other frontline workers are being mandated to take tests in order to be able to return, uh, return to work. And so, you know, when we look at the stats, um, it's staggering. We're, we're running somewhere around 700,000 in COVID tests a day. Um, we, we may be maxing out the supply chain with the current types of tests that are available. 
l locally here in Florida, we're experiencing some testing sites that can't report for 10 plus days. Um, tons of questions remain unanswered after you take a test. Are you still contagious? Do you go to work? Do you go to school? Do you have to quarantine and, and for how long? It's really a confusing scenario for everyone and adding delays on top of it um, just adds to that, uh, to that confusion and, and frustration. I, I've actually been reading about a group of epidemiologists who have this, um, this big idea on how to change testing and they believe it could allow us to control the virus uh, within, uh, within a month, in, in three or four weeks, which seems unbelievable, right? Um, the, to start with, the ultimate goal, as we, uh, as we previously talked about, is really to identify the sick and then separate those sick people uh, from the people who are well. Um, and as a part of that, um, that testing, we then would focus the testing on the frontline workers, right? Uh, folks in healthcare, law enforcement, teachers, uh, folks working in grocery stores, get them tested since they are really critical for the country to run. Uh, these epidemiologists then think uh, to focus on a different type of testing. Um, remember, we're processing close to 700,000 tests a day and um, we've got those big delays in the results. They believe there are some other testing methods. Um, the kind that are this thin paper strip, it's, it's very low cost um, to manufacture and very low cost to distribute. It only requires a person's saliva and the results come back, not in 10 plus days, but in 15 minutes. Their idea is to produce these in mass. Uh, obviously, it would require uh, a large backing by the federal government. Um, think almost like wartime production. Um, but then, if these were produced in mass, anyone entering an office, anyone entering a movie theater, or even a Target could take one of these tests, and in 15 minutes, we would know. Um, the beauty of this type of system with the small strip is that it doesn't require a specialized system to read the results. And that's what is taking all of the delays with the current testing that is going on right now. This strip would simply change color and identify an either a positive or negative result. So it's really a, it's, it's really a fascinating area to look at of what the epidemiologist believe could be done differently than what we're doing today. What are, um, Vince, what are some technologies being used for contact tracing today? Yeah, I'd say there's, uh, there's really two categories. Um, one falls into the category of case management tools, uh, and the other is really proximity and exposure notification tools. Let's, let's talk about the case management tools first. Um, these types of tools uh, are really used by the frontline workers inside of public health departments, uh, the nurses, the epidemiologists, and, and related staff. They really uh, hope to streamline the electronic capture and management of the data on patients and contacts um, through automation and contact notification and follow up with those patients. Um, it really is meant to allow the patients and contacts to um, electronically self-report some of that crucial demographic uh, and clinical data. Uh, for example, um, there are a number of health departments that actually are using automated surveys that go out to get daily health status information. Um, and then, of course, uh, those case management tools can integrate with state systems and also be used for reporting um, so that, you know, there's a lot of good information for those frontline workers and really identifying um, what is critical for follow-up um, from a priority perspective by each and every one of their staff. When, when you start thinking about the uh, proximity and exposure notifications, this is really a different set of tools. 
And while it may integrate with some of the case management systems out there, um, these are really um, smartphone applications. So something that might be on your, uh, your iPhone or your Android phone. Uh, it's a Bluetooth or GPS technology. It's, uh, it's voluntary. Uh, users uh, like you and me have to opt in in order to uh, use them. And it's really used to try to identify the proximity and duration of someone's exposure um, to, uh, let's say, a patient or a contact that's been diagnosed with something like COVID-19. There, there's really a limited amount of usage of these types of apps today. And, you know, the public health departments are still trying to understand the value of how that mobile application and technology uh, can be used inside of the, uh, the public health departments. Great. Thanks, Vince. Terry, there's a lot of people in the news you hear about called contact tracers. Who are they and where do they fit into the whole picture? Sure. The contact tracers are really people that are hired or are volunteers who just really help out with that tracing process. So really they're they're making phone calls to people who've reported it or people who've potentially been in contact with these infectious diseases and they're trying to get information and even help them or give them the education or other uh, details and links they might need to, to better get some treatment. And uh, so, and that's what's been done historically is uh, on larger scale um, cases and things that we're dealing with, they would bring in more and more of these, these tracers to help because of the amount of people that would have to be notified or called and as you can imagine, it's just a very cumbersome process and bringing in people isn't you know, always the best way to make things more efficient. So uh, people aren't really answering their phones as much as they would do in the past. So trying to get a hold of people through a telephone call has just been a challenge in itself. Yes, somewhere around 40,000 contact tracers um, right now that are employed by um, different public health departments around the country. Um, there are some projections that say we're going to need maybe a hundred thousand of these contact tracers um, really to effectively battle uh, the pandemic. And you can imagine, right, for every positive infection, these tracers on average generally need to contact 10 other people. Um, the information they provide, right, when they're contacting people downstream uh, is absolutely voluntary and some people want to comply and some people don't want to cooperate. So they have a really, really tough job and there's a lot of them out there. Great. So how did ImageSoft get involved with contact tracing? Yeah, so we actually um, have a, um, a customer, which is Ottawa County, and inside of their public health department when the pandemic started, uh, their staff started seeing this trend of um, just a, a very large number of cases coming in as the, um, as the initial news and, and the spread started to happen. Um, so, you know, part of their daily routine is needing to perform um, the daily contact tracing. Um, that is a requirement that they really have to reach out to each one of those potentially exposed people um, on, a daily bis uh, on a daily basis. And they are using a system inside of the state of Michigan, which is called uh, MDSS. It stands for the, the Michigan Disease Surveillance System. Um, that's really the data that's used to report to the CDC. So they, they actually decided um, to create their own case management tool for the nurses and epidemiologists. So they actually import the data from MDSS into OnBase, and that's where they manage all of the specific demographic information um, about COVID-19, the different cases, the contacts, uh, health status, symptoms, exposures, location information. Um, instead of trying to get an army of people to make phone calls, they actually integrated a survey tool, which sends out two daily questions about the status of that patient. Um, and that is done via text or email. And this data, the survey information that comes back daily, 
um, gets integrated back into the case management application and really prioritizes work for the nurses and epidemiologists. Um, they, they did an incredible job here because there's actually correspondence letters that get sent out from the system to each one of the um, patients or contacts and they actually have a very large uh, bilingual community. And so they have follow-up correspondence that actually can be in English or Spanish that go out at different stages for the case. Um, they also did something really cool for the public. They, they took a lot of their, uh, their information about what they knew with exposures and positive cases and they integrated that with a reporting dashboard on the Ottawa website so they can actually report number of cases, hotspots within the county, um, and, that's, and, that's with, uh, and that's with Esri, which is a very popular uh, county mechanism that's used to map geographic information for a, a, a lot of counties and a lot of states um, throughout the country. Just an amazing job of trying to automate a little bit of the process and help prioritize the work for the nurses and epidemiologists as these cases just kept increasing and increasing. That's a great story. What types of capabilities have your customers implemented in helping them with the fight of the spread of COVID-19? Yeah, well, um, Ottawa had a lot of success. They, they actually uh, uh, configured and deployed this application within a couple of weeks of the pandemic starting. And so they started telling their story um, to other counties uh, within the state of Michigan. Uh, and, and now there are 10 other counties in addition to Ottawa that are utilizing this technology. Uh, it's something that can be deployed very quickly. It's available in the cloud uh, and it really can be expanded uh, to any state or any county uh, that is currently having some challenges uh, with their with their public health staff and, and trying to manage the data, just the voluminous data um, from the pandemic. That's great. Hey, Terry, have any technologies been deployed that are not being widely accepted by the public? Yeah, I mean, initially, too, when we started seeing people trying to, you know, combat this with technology, we'd see them maybe try to, to retrofit like an ERP or a relationship management system that they'd already owned. And those just really didn't track all the necessary information. They kind of lacked some of the reporting metrics needed for something like this. And they really just didn't have a way to involve the public directly. So there was always that kind of need there. And then with, uh, you know, the, the kind of mobile community, obviously there's these kind of apps that they've put out with Apple and Google, right, into um, people's phones out into the public where they could kind of report and, and add some information. But the adoption rate on that was just extremely low. People didn't really... No, there wasn't a lot of education about what those were for. Uh, getting people to use something that they don't really understand and stuff like that has been a challenge and uh, was unfortunately way lower than anticipated. So a lot of the detailed metrics, you know, weren't coming in through those mechanisms. Great. These challenges are things that our customers are seeing all the time. What types of success have you seen from some of our customers who are using this contract tracing solution, Ben? Yeah, um, you know, I, I mentioned Ottawa a few minutes ago, and, um, you know, as of last month, they had automated surveys going out, um, I believe, over 20,000 surveys with over a 91% response rate, um, which is pretty much unheard of. Uh, they estimated that it saved their staff almost 3,000 hours which obviously makes uh, a huge impact in the patient care and just being able to respond um, when, you know, case counts are, uh, are spiking and, and going up um, around the county and, and really throughout the U.S. So just uh, uh, amazing statistics with the amount of information that they've been able to automate um, so that they can give um, better, better patient care inside of the county. Those surveys sound a great way to engage the public and make it a little easier for folks to uh, respond back to the public health department. So that's great. Are there other areas which are becoming a new focus for contract tracing since the pandemic start? Obviously, fall is happening. Schools are starting. 
Uh, are there other um, contract tracing focuses that are becoming in, in, into the primary focus? Yeah, that's that's absolutely right. My uh, my son started his uh, first day of school yesterday, and so we're starting to see um, a number of large school districts that are looking for their own contact tracing application, um, which obviously is going to be uh, used to help protect teachers, students, and staff as the country is now, um, you know, across the U.S., going to be going back uh, for face-to-face -face instruction in, uh, in all of our schools. So uh, there's definitely another area where, um, you know, the contact tracing is going to be very, very important to, uh, to, to stop the spread of infection and, and try to protect folks as they go back, uh, go back to class. That's great. One last final question. If someone wanted to see how this technology works and how it's being used in their public health department, what should they do? Who should they contact? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the team here at ImageSoft uh, actually has a live demo, as I uh, mentioned before. Uh, this technology has been deployed inside of public health as well as in the cloud. Um, we have the ability to uh, take a health department uh, through the application uh, to see the types of data uh, that can be managed and how the um, process is automated, uh, how it can be used for uh, reporting statistics inside of the county. And uh, we're actually going to be hosting a webinar uh, next month, about 30 days from now on September 24th. Uh, and there'll be more information that we can um, show live and uh, and obviously demonstrate uh, this fantastic solution to uh, to help control the spread of uh, of COVID-19. That's great. Vince, Terry, thank you for joining us today. It's been an educational session with our panel trying to understand the day in the life of a public health department and seeing how they're responding to the many challenges we are all now living with on a daily basis. If you'd like to learn more about ImageSoft or our solutions for public health department, departments, please go ahead and visit our website at imagesoftinc.com. We'll be hosting an upcoming panel webinar on contact tracing in September and hope you can join us for that session. This concludes today's podcast. Thanks for attending and have a great day. Thanks again for joining us on this podcast. To learn more about ImageSoft, please visit imagesoftinc.com. That's imagesoftinc.com. If you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to Paperless Productivity, where we tackle some of the biggest paper-based pain points facing organizations today. We'll see you next time.